Lisa Fletcher and you're in the stream. Today, as the largest generation comes of age, how are millennials, those born after 1980, leveraging technology to find personal success and economic opportunity? Our digital producer Malika Bilal is here looking out for your live feedback. Malika, this show hits home with a lot of people in our community, many of whom like this idea of being a generation without boundaries, but they also say we face a lot of pretty unique challenges. And we're seeing all of those things in the tweets that we're getting. So we shared this quiz from the Pew Research Center, uh, just basically trying to find out how millennial people are. And it asked you things, questions like, do you have a landline phone? Do you read the newspaper? I took it. I got a 72, which is on the low end of the millennial scale. And <laughs> our community members also tweeted in a response. A lot of them skewed towards the higher end. But we also got this tweet from Milana, who got a 96, which is very millennial. And she says, the question is, is a high millennial score something we should strive for? Well, that's something we'll ask our guests today during the show. But join us with your thoughts by tweeting us with the hashtag AJStream. Something I'm asking is, how did I get a higher score on that than you? <laughs> I wonder. It seems wrong. <laughs> uh, joining us on set is Nick Troiano. He is the co-founder and national field director for the Can Kicks Back. That's a millennial-driven campaign to help solve America's financial crisis. Nick, nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Yeah. We've also got participants in our Google Plus Hangout today. They're going to be chatting with us throughout the program. Remember, we want you to be in a Google Hangout, too. To do that, just add the stream to your circles. Hi, I'm Dorothy O, co-communications manager for Eastern Francophone Africa for Google, and I'm in the stream. Millennials, or Generation Y, account for the largest group of young people coming into adulthood in history. They've been characterized and caricatured as tuned out, entitled, and lazy. But in an era of economic hardship and global uncertainty, they're sort of redefining success. So should we be calling millennials brave, curious, and adept? This generation is really embracing the idea of a life full of purpose, a life full of meaning, a career that has meaning, um, a life that has meaning, a job that has meaning, uh, a home and a community that is more complex than simply geographic location. Uh, so I think that that's, that's one of the most exciting things about this generation. Millennials have grown as the internet has grown. They're more ethnically diverse than ever before, but less politically active than their parents. They're spiritual, but they are less religious. And perhaps one of their most defining characteristics is their willingness to share themselves online. This always connected generation is changing the way the world works, one tweet, one Facebook status, and one Instagram post at a time. So today we take a look at this niche that millennials are creating for themselves and whether they're able to leverage the technology of their generation for success. Joining us on Skype is Derek Feldman. He is the CEO of Achieve. That is a creative research and fundraising agency. He's also part of something called the Millennial Impact Project. That's a research initiative looking at how the generation connects and gives to social causes. Derek, I want to start with you. Define for us the millennial generation beyond, you know, the 80 million people between the ages of 20 and 33. Lisa, thanks. I'm excited to be here. Uh, when we think about the millennial generation, really three concepts come to mind. Uh, the first one being the generation is what we call solutions inspired. They are really inspired passionately to try and look at those solutions in the community, whether they also even be at work, to try and make change happen. And they're also socially connected. You know, we talk about technology, but it's not just the technology that connects them. It's the relationships that they have with their peers, their small groups as well. And I'll say that there's this piece around transparency that millennials really want to hear and know the work that I do at the office, the work that I do in my community matters. And so from that standpoint, we really need to help millennials understand how their work in a social connected environment can make a difference. All right. Um, Nick, what do you think the priorities and the values really are of the millennial generation? Well, uh, I agree with other guests today that millennials value solutions. We're a generation that faces enormous problems that are in pretty bad shape and are getting worse. And I think we 
place a premium on how to solve those problems and don't necessarily see government as a solution or the private sector as a solution. We want to find out well, whatever is the best way to, to get it done in a sort of pragmatic fashion. Which raises an interesting point because one thing that we've seen uh, time and time again in studies about the millennial generation is that it is actually less politically engaged, less civically active. So how does a generation that wants to create change do that with, without those mechanisms? Well, in a sense, I think our disengagement from the political process is sort of rational on the part of young people. We see a system that isn't very responsive when we vote, when we contact our members. So I think a lot of the energy that we have and desire to solve problems is being shifted in ways of community volunteerism and creating social enterprise, things that we can see a tangible result for our efforts. Uh, politics, I don't think nowadays, is seen as a, a very uh, effective way to spend your time. I disagree with that, and I think that's one of the challenges and opportunities we have to show young people why re-engaging is actually the solution to our political problem. And as we move along yeah. in the program, I want you to talk more about how you're working on doing that, because I know that's one of your areas of, of focus and expertise. And Derek, well, well, Nick just talked about you know being uh, engaged, politically engaged, but of course we also hear about how this generation is apathetic. We have a tweet here from Nicholas Slayton, though. He says, I am at least sick of people overanalyzing my generation as if we're one cohesive narcissistic group. So <laughs> it, it, could you speak to that, how, I mean, it's a bit uh, simplistic to overanalyze and how all of those things could uh, end up being found in this generation? Absolutely. You know, it's, it's funny, as we look at the generation, uh, in, and I'll have this and I'll speak to in groups of people that will say, you know, the millennials represent all of the things that you just said. And I said, you know, there are boomers that ha represent the same sort of things. And in fact, when we look at the connection between what millennials, uh, some of their characteristics and even boomers, they're very similar. It's just that there are, you know, digital, ch digital differences between us both. And when I think about all of the generalities that might exist on the generation, the, the person that had that tweet is, is absolutely correct. It's not so much that we're trying to put millennials in certain buckets of, of people and characteristics, because what we see is that millennials, they're just interested in action and solution. And so whether that's at work, whether that's at home, whether that's wherever it is, they're institution agnostic. And so it means that they want to create change. And they are who they are. When they enter the job place, when they go through those front doors, it doesn't mean I'm now just a worker for the company. It, I still am the millennial. I still am who I am and what I care about. And I want to use any outlet I can to share that with people and to help others. I, I think that for every every bad maybe millennial there is, there's other people in other generations to the same. And we can focus on some of the challenges that exist within the generation. But for a large majority of the generation, they're interested, as our guest is also speaking here too, is to find a way to make things better. And whatever outlet that they're going to have at their disposal, whether that's a mobile phone or whether that's on the company resources, they're going to take advantage of that. And I think that's a great opportunity, not a negative. Well, Derek, one of the things you're talking about is change. And there are some things that have definitely changed between millennials and previous generations. I want to take a, clip, a look at a clip from an upcoming documentary. It's called Nameless. It's going to come out later this year. And we're going to listen to a part where there are some millennials talking about how work has really changed for their generation. My grandpa's generation worked harder for less. I, I think we're getting it easier. It was nothing to have students say like, oh, I'm going to make $300,000, $500,000 in my top grossing year. Um, and now students are definitely more realistic. I want to say a career, but that idea has been <laughs> getting thrown out of the window lately too. I don't know how much I believe in careers anymore. Uh, Derek, let's pick up on her last comment. She seems to like the idea of a career, but doesn't really believe in the concept of it anymore. Do you think that's strictly a function of, of the of the recession that the millennial generation went through? It, it's hard to ignore the data. You know, if we look at it right now, 50% of those that graduate within the first year are under are unemployed. Of the ones that are employed, they're actually underemployed. So not necessarily the jobs that they really went to school to do. And so, yeah, I think that's a, that definitely is a situation of the environment we're currently in. But I also think that it goes to the sense that a lot of millennials may not have experienced the jobs that they necessarily want yet or are, you know, are aspiring to be. 
Uh, and I think that's the difference between work and culture today from where other generations, even Gen X or boomers, you know, when, I, when my dad told me, Derek, you really got to get a great job, stick it out, get great benefits, stick long term with the company, advance, and that's just how things are. Well, today, I think millennials are interested in going to work and to find their passion and being okay with maybe the first job I get is not necessarily the place I may end up at. And learning from that, and, and what we're seeing now, employ, employers, some of the biggest ones in the country saying, you know, it's okay as long as I can help you advance and help you get to that next position. So it's not so much that you're always here, but that I can help you professionally. And I think that some millennials just haven't had that experience yet in addition to that environment, which is why we're getting some of that commentary. Well, you talked about finding your passion through work and uh, the next person in our hangout, Ben Milstein, uh, did just that when he founded Massive TV. Uh, but Ben, before you you talk about and tell us what that is, I want you to look at this Facebook comment. Um, and it's talking about the difference between being engaged and aware. Chairman Miao says, by simply liking the fan page of something I believe in, I'm able to excuse myself from contributing actual time, money, or effort towards solving a social issue while still reaping the benefits of self-aggrandizement and cognitive consonance. Of course, that's a bit tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> but he gets a response. Henry says, easily available technology has actually given much of the world's population a more definitive voice and power structures. So it's not just about clicktivism per se. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, that, that's interesting. I think there's a big difference between being engaged and being aware. But like Nick said, there's a lot of uh, pressure on millennials to solve problems from climate change, uh, gay and women's rights issues, etc. And we're constantly being reminded of that pressure through the news and social media. And it makes us more civically minded for sure. But I think self-centered at the same time. It can happen at once. Facebook's a great example. There were a series of racially charged incidents when I was a senior at Northwestern and I posted about it. And I got two results. One was to actually converse with a few classmates uh, who had really different beliefs, which is what I'd wanted. But I also got 100 likes, people stopping me on, a camp on campus, a lot of attention. And it feeds this perception that people are watching and waiting to hear from you. And I think that perception can really mess with our sense of what it means to be a responsible citizen. Uh, Nick, we were talking a little bit earlier about this idea of engagement in politics. Ben just sort of touched on it a little bit there. Um, and one of the things that you do is you work toward encouraging the millennial generation to engage. How do you do that? Sure. Uh, the Can Kicks Back is the campaign I'm working on, and our mission is to mobilize young Americans to sort of take charge of their future and pressure Congress to deal with our large and growing national debt. And we realize we have to do two things for that to succeed. The first is communicate this issue in a way that young people can relate to, in an authentic way coming from other young people, and second, give them a meaningful way to take action and make an impact. So right, because lots of people, I mean, off of Malika's clicktivism, how do you get from that to actually, you know, boots on the ground right. making a difference? Well, I think online tools are as effective to the extent they can get people offline. You mm -hmm. know, change happens in person. Uh, the Arab Spring, it would be nothing without Tour Square, for example. In our own campaign, you know, we built out a social uh, media presence, but the most progress we've made is when we took a few dozen of our leaders to Capitol Hill to meet with their elected representatives, and a bill got introduced on a project they're working on shortly thereafter. It happens when people show up. But I think these online tools can be leveraged to connect people all around the country who are sort of like-minded and want to take action together, to have a collective voice, and to begin you know, planning and organizing offline action. You're talking about right. online tools. Our community has something to say about that. Gabrielle says, technology will be the millennial generation's greatest ally. We see it as a means to provide a better future for all. And Ezra says, you know, we asked a question about sharing and what you share. And he says, sometimes his friends get on his case about all the things he shares using these tools. But I think they want to be well informed. And shouldn't they? So I want to go to Stephanie in our Hangout next. Stephanie Wilson, you're the co-founder and CTO of Notch. Tell us what that is and, and how it's encouraged people to share and what it is they're sharing. And Stephanie, first, could you unmute your microphone? So sorry about that. Thanks for having me. Um, so Notch basically is trying to create a place online, a community where millennials, people in our generation, can start to express their opinions on both political issues, social issues, um, movies, TV, sort of anything of interest and really create dialogue around topics that we want to discuss. The idea is, 
you know, social media is so prevalent in our generation, but we've really spent a lot of time defining ourselves based on our photos, our friendships, our connections. And we want to allow people to define themselves based on their opinions, um, make sure they have a voice and can be counted. Derek, how has this generation's view of sharing changed how they look at themselves, how they look at the rest of the world, and what are the dangers of oversharing? <laughs> well, you know, when we look at uh, the concepts of sharing, it's interesting, and this even comes out of Facebook and some of the researchers that are there. Paul Adams has done some incredible work, too. When we look at sharing, we, we typically like to share and interact with a very small group within our social networks, although we know there's so many more individuals within that network. And it's in, as one of the individuals said here, is that some of us are looking for a response. You know, it doesn't necessarily feel good when you post an image or post commentary and nobody reacts to any of it. You know, it's almost like, well, nobody really cared in the network. And so we do see some of that. And, and some people take that to the, well, I'm going to share even more if I'm not getting response. Or if some people do like things, then I'll keep sharing more and more and more and not limiting themselves. And I think that that environment of sharing is an opportunity, but yeah, it can be the challenge for the individual that overshares. And all of us have probably decided to hide a few people when they went to the extreme, of course. But as we look at that sharing concept, it's really born within the generation to look at how do I share my ideas? How do I share my solutions? How do I share what I want to do and accomplish both at work and, and in the community? And that also resonates in the consumer marketplace where new concepts around shared economy has sort of come to light where concepts like Zipcar and others are coming about to say, you know, you can rent things, you can share things for a small amount of time and pay for those things for that amount of time and not necessarily own them. And so I definitely see that consistent thread of sharing not only within personal life, professional, but also in how they do consumer spending. And that sharing is just one of the things that a lot of, of the parents of this generation don't necessarily understand. I mean, many of the millennials say they're actually redefining the values of their parents. Here's author David Burstein's take on all of it. And I think that there's been a real shift in values and a, look, a looking towards happiness, towards community instead of home ownership, towards love instead of marriage. And, you know, for a long time, we built up this idea of America, which was that, you know, you need to you know, buy a home in order to be part of a community and you need to get married in order to, you know, legitimize your love for someone. And this generation is really redefining those things. Nick, redefining sounds good now, but how does it play out 5, 10, 20 years from now? in terms of when this generation maybe hasn't bought a house, hasn't engaged in the traditional ways um, that the economy is pushed forward? Well, I think uh, redefinition is a, is a good thing. We need to innovate because, you know, the millennial generation has also been called generation screwed because we know... Generation what? Generation screwed. I mean, because we know that the economy that we have now and the political system we have now aren't working in our favor, mm -hmm. and we need to inno innovate outside of it if we hope to have the opportunity as a future as good as our parents and grandparents had. Uh, Derek, can you think of any examples off the top of your head of how Gen Y is changing things and changing the economy in a good way? Yeah, absolutely. I think that what Gen Y has done in certain circumstances is to help us, uh, help us at least in our communities understand how things operate and be more transparent. And we see that with governments and where, you know, there's con concepts around open government in which that millennials are tackling some of the issues that they're going out there with certain cities and, and saying, you know, I want to come at it and be challenged and help those things happen. And I also think that when we look at the consumer spending side or uh, when millennials are trying to buy products, we have seen a rise of products that are socially minded, that those products from method to others in which that they look at certain, pro uh, they look at the practices and what they do and say this matters to a consumer base, a younger demographic that maybe our overarching consumer base and it's important. And, and that decision for companies to look at how they produce products and how they how they work in the community is also influencing all of their consumer type marketing and advertising. And we see millennials really driving some of that interaction and engagement for, for all generations when it comes to products. 
Oh, well, Stephanie, he talked about, uh, you know, Derek just talked about driving that innovation. And I'm wondering, with your side, what do you say to criticism to people who say, who cares what you're sharing? Who cares what you <laughs> had for breakfast? And why do you need to ask for someone else's opinion on, you know, what you should buy at the mall? What do you say to criticism like that? Are we generation overshare? <laughs> I think that being generation overshare is just the first step in being generation share things that are important. If we're only asking people to share things that we feel are important, we're, alien we're alienating them from defining themselves in what they see as important to their own identities. So if somebody wants to be expressing that they had a turkey sandwich for lunch or what they bought at the mall, but that also leads them to... Um, to really to feel like they're empowered to share when they have an opinion on gay marriage after they've read an article, um, then in my view, that's okay, and that's kind of an optimal outcome. And if yeah. I maybe can add a thought yeah, go ahead, here, sir. I think um, the problem isn't oversharing. We live in an information world, and we're only going to get more information out there. Uh, the solution to it isn't share less. It's develop better filters. If you're online or in, in the real world, seek the sources of information that you think are important and create filters so that you are able to receive and react to that uh, information. And I think media literacy is something that um, ought to be you know, integrated in a much more meaningful way in, into public education, too. Good point. Derek, I know you wanted to jump in. Right. And I'd say, too, that millennials, just like any other generation, are using social technologies and social networks grow and advance in, in the, uh, their ability to use it effectively. I mean, the first time that some of us decided to use Twitter and Facebook, we were sh oversharing maybe things that were not as important, turkey sandwiches and others. But as we look over the time of your post, you start to share the things that are the most relevant to you, and you sort of grow up within that social network and your ability to share with other people so that they, so that they know when you do share something, it's really important to you, not necessarily some of the smaller things that you do. And so social networks in general, we're still learning. I mean, social media is an, ever, is an evolution still. And so I think that people have started to move away from necessarily just that type of personal sharing toward towards more um, conscious sharing of topics and issues that they care about. But, but do, you, are, do you have any concern that there is a conflation between sharing and doing? I mean, absolutely. You know, there are some that would say, I'm going to share this in, in a topic that I care about, and I'm just going to leave it out there and, and not act upon it. And what we see within the social cause space is that 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 at least action begins to build awareness. And it should be the goal of the organization to then take it and say, now that we have people talking about our issue, what is the next step for them to do something with? And if the organizations haven't established that message and that next step for people, it's not surprising that they're just going to sit in an environment where we're just sharing things and nothing happens after it. Ben, what's most valuable about the millennial generation? Well, you know, I think we have to use the tools at our disposal to do something more than just be on Facebook. Uh, um, I co-founded a group that I'm working on called NASMO. I'm going to go and shamelessly plug this URL. The idea is that young people today are developing all these new creative skills and they need outlets for their creative and intellectual expression outside of work. So we're holding monthly meetups in Brooklyn where young people can actually come together, meet collaborators, and our long-term vision is to build a chapter in every major city so that no matter where you are, a creative community can come to you. You don't just have to get it online can get that physical connection, you know, that one-to-one -one interaction that really, really makes that connection matter. You know, speaking of, of, of interaction and things online, Sleepless NBA says an actual real life sharing project is a street bank. It encourages the sharing of actual tangible goods and services and time. And, and Ben, that just goes yeah. to what you were saying, you know, taking uh, the online to the real world, the talking into the doing. Derek, we've got about 30 seconds left in the program. Why don't you wrap it up for us? Yeah, I would say that in working with millennials, and, and hopefully that's a lot of the audience here, we have got some incredible millennials here, is that we need to do four things. We need to invite them to our leadership discussions. We need to challenge them with creating solutions for things that, that are challenging our communities and at work and our products and the things that we do. And then lastly, is that we create the connectivity between the millennial generation and others in the community to make things happen. All right. Essentially that we are out of time, but Derek Feldman and Nick Triana, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone in our Google Hangout for joining us today on tomorrow's program. Malaysians heading to the polls in what could be the closest election since independence. Join us for that.